Very good morning, everybody. It's my great pleasure to introduce Federico de Mazzola. He's a 3rd year resident and he will be talking about neuroendocrine neoplasms, particularly of the appendix and small bowel. Enjoy. Thank you, Professor Lehmann, for your introduction and good morning and welcome to everyone to today's residence lecture on neurocrine neoplasms of the jejunum, ilium and of the appendix. We will start first with some general aspects and then we will go into the specifics of appendiceal and jejunal and ileal neuroendocrine neoplasms. Since the topic of NETs are, is, is very wide and vast, um, I will only be discussing um, the approaches and treatment of localized disease, otherwise it will um, go beyond the scope of this lecture. So in the general aspects for me, it's important to show some tools and definitions that we can use to tackle neuroendocrine tumors, um, and then before going into the specific details. So neuroendocrine neoplasms are maybe not an everyday topic for most of us, so I think it's best to start with a definition, which is really that it's a tumor that arises from cells that um, release hormones in response to a signal that they receive from the nervous system. This causes usually that they, that leads usually to a higher than normal amount of hormones, which then cause um, different symptoms. As you can see depicted, it can occur in, in actually any tissue that has this connection between hormones and neurological system, and the most typical being the intestine, the lung, and the pancreas. In our case, then, for the small intestine, it's the serotonin-producing enterochromaffin cells that then undergo this neoplastic change. Because the world of neuroendocrine neoplasms is ever-changing, and um, also the terminology that is associated with it changes a lot as well. So the old term of carcinoid is not used anymore. We have the umbrella term of neuroendocrine neoplasms, and under that nomenclature, we have the neuroendocrine tumors and the neuroendocrine carcinomas, which are different entities or subcategories um, of the WHO classification. We will go into a bit of detail in a minute. So we will start with our first question, neuroendocrine neoplasms, what is the prevalence of them in 100,000 cases per year? Do you think it's rather rare, 0.5, 5, 50, 500? Any of the residents? Yeah, even rarer, it's 0.5, so it's um, a very rare disease, as we can see, and also despite Despite a rather steady um, incident rate of malignant neoplasms in general, we can see a clear upward trend um, of a new endocrine neoplasms in the past 40 years. This trend is also on one hand um, due to better diagnostics, but also because we really better understand this specific neoplastic entity. If we look at the incidence of the nets at different sites, we can see that the green curve represents the small intestine, which is on number two, or the second most common neuroendocrine neoplasm according to incident. And um, it is suspected to surpass the nets of the lung in the, in the next few years. On the pie chart, that is broken down of the incidence of neoplasms just of the gastrointestinal tract. For, with that, I want to show you that the small intestine and the appendix, they really represent a large part of neuroendocrine neoplasms of the GI tract and why they're so important. The research and everything around this topic is a subject to a lot of change. So it's really, with current research efforts, it's important that the classification and grading is always up to date. This is the newest one by the WHO in 2019. The main difference or the main importance that we have is that we differentiate between the well-differentiated and the poorly differentiated tumors, which then has a big influence on how we treat, um, how we treat these entities. This division is based on two variables. On one side, the mitotic rate, and on one side, the K67 index, which are both markers of cell proliferation. As a rule of thumb, we can say the higher the proliferation, the more aggressive the tumor. Looking at the small cell and large cell types, those are also um, aggressive tumors that represent nearly a different entity and that also have a different treatment in comparison to the ones above. What's missing in this part is really, um, we also can differentiate between functional and non-functional tumors. 
Today we will only be speaking about non-functional that are not hormonally active. We can also use um, biochemical markers as aid for our diagnostics. Um, chromogranin A being one of the most important biomarker with a rather high sensitivity and specificity, but it has especially a value as follow-up biomarker. As you can see in this description, depiction, it has a wide range of functions in the GI tract, but also in the cardiovascular system. Another important one is um, the 5-HIAA, um, which is pre um, present in carcinoid syndrome. It's a metabolite of serotonin that also with high sensitivity and specificity, but there we have a high interference with certain foods and drugs, which makes double testing um, very important to receive a, a valid result. In regard to imaging, the most significant ones are the gallium dotatate PET-CT and the FDG-PET. The dotatate PET-CT marks somastatin receptors, um, is highly sensitive and specific, and is important for low-grade tumors, whereas the FDG-PET um, is a marker of metabolism and is more important for high-grade tumors. We can see a correlation shown by the Marburg effect, meaning the higher the grade of the tumor, meaning the higher proliferation rate and um, higher uptake of glucose, the more important, um, or we have a shift between the dotatate to the FDG imaging. Important for us, we're not alone in this complex topic, an ever-changing topic. We have the European Neurocrine Tumor Society, ENETS, um, that issues and publish standards regularly and, and they has regular updates. We at the University Hospital are certified as Center of Excellence and we have an interdisciplinary net board for which we present every patient. So now we will continue to the neuroendocrine neoplasms of the appendix. The neuroendocrine neoplasm of the appendix have an overall very low incidence. But, and its main source is in discoveries and incidental discoveries in appendectomies in about three to five of a thousand appendectomies. The mean age is around 45 years and is also rarely seen in pediatric patients. But it represents a significant amount of neoplasms of the appendix. And important also for here to show the prognostic values. So low tumor stages, as we can see in the bar chart, have very high um, survival rates. As soon as we then talk about advanced stages with distant um, metastases, this, um, this five-year survival rate sinks significantly. You can also see that in the other chart where, it's charted, where the different grades are charted against each other. Um, so that also shows again how important this grading is. So maybe a question for everyone with a raise of hands. Do you think that appendiceal neurocrine neoplasms cause acute appendicitis? Who is for yes? Okay. Who is for no? Nobody? <laughs> so really, the answer is not 100% no, but it's very unlikely that... Um, NENs of the appendix cause um, an appendicitis, and this is due to their location in the appendix. So they are rarely symptomatic. It's usually an incidental diagnosis um, at appendectomy, and 70% are located at the tip of the appendix. They're usually not causative of the acute appendicitis. Then, of course, the disease can cause abdominal pain, bowel obstruction, and in very rare cases, carcinoid syndrome, but this is only if the um, disease is extensive or metastasized. So diagnostic procedures in the appendix are a bit, are a bit special to talk about because usually we have a post-operative diagnostic unless we have really a suspected reason to do that beforehand. So any post-apodectomy that we have an under one centimeter R0 resection, there is no need for any further diagnostics. As soon as we go towards the two centimeters or, or um, also um, infiltration of the meso appendix or uh, angio invasion, then we will need to think about um, further imaging. Also laboratory tests, chromogranin A as a tumor marker, but also as important differentiation to globet cell carcinoma, which has a different treatment. 
Important, important in all neuroendocrine tumor is the, um, the pathology grading and staging. There will be an immune histochemical staining with synaptophysin, chromogranin A, and KI67, and that will then put the tumor um, in an according stage. Um, important is that we have this two centimeter mark, um, and from there, it's all, the second factor that is important is if, if there's an invasion of an infiltration of, um, of the meso appendix or not. These stages then lead to the therapeutic approach. This seems very confusing. The most simple part is the above two centimeters. So if we have tumors above two centimeters, we will go for the right-sided hemicolectomy. That is a pretty straightforward approach. Then it gets a bit more complicated if we have small tumors, so under one centimeter. And then we will have to discuss the risk factors. So where is the tumor located? Is there an infiltration of the meso appendix or not? Um, is there an angio invasion? What is the grade of the tumor? So if these factors are low or not present, we will go for just an appendectomy. And usually we will have a, a treatment that is then done. We will need no other follow-up. In case, if there are risk factors present or that there's a tumor that is in between these margins, um, then we will have to discuss between an appendectomy or then a second right-sided hemicolectomy. A study has shown that the risk of metastasize coincides with also the growth of the tumor with a cutoff of about 1.5 centimeters. So anything below 1.5 centimeter will have a low metastasis risk. The prognostic factors is, as mentioned before, the smaller the tumor, the lower the stage, the higher or a very, very good survival. So 1A has 100% um, long-term survival. Then this discussion about risk of metastasis from 1.5 centimeters. And then as soon as these stages go up, we have a higher risk of metastasis which coincides with a bad survival. The location we've also talked about tip being the most present, which makes an R0 resection very important, but also probable. And then the invasion of the meso appendix is more common in children than in adults. The follow-up um, also coincides if we have the um, therapeutic approach, we can mirror that to that as well. Um, so as soon as you have that well differentiated an R0 resection, and depending on the size, we will have no to just simple follow-up, whereas as soon as we go to an extensive disease, we have, we'll, we'll have more regular follow-ups with CTs and MRIs. So now we will continue to the jejunum and the ileum. Here things get a bit more complicated. So it has a higher incidence in comparison to the appendix, um, but it represents really a large chunk of intestinal neoplasms. The Overall survival is worse than in comparison to the appendix, as you can see with the green boxes, also in comparison to the other tumors. And then here again, stage and grade are of the importance. The problem is that we tend to catch this tumor later than we want. So a lot of people associate carcinoid syndrome with neuroendocrine neoplasms. What are the typical symptoms of carcinoid syndrome. Muscle cramping, headache and vertigo, flushes and diarrhea or hemoptysis. I would say C, flushes and diarrhea. It's definitely not one of the only symptoms, but they're the most common ones. You can see here that there are uh, various, um, it's a whole syndrome with various uh, clinical presentations but diarrhea and flush being the two most important ones. Clinically, the tumors of the jejunum and the ileum, they show only with unspecific pain, um, and only a few, so up to 5% have the carcinoid syndrome, which is caused by an overproduction of serotonin. But this is also a very rare clinical presentation and is reserved exclusively, actually, for the patients, for patients with liver metastasis. Again, if we go into more extensive disease, the, the symptoms will become more severe and may lead to obstruction or mesenteric ischemia. Now, what is our diagnostic 
approach for the jejunum and the ileum. So it really starts of how the tumor initially presents itself. Is it an incidental finding through abdominal pain? Is it um, an abdominal, in, do we see it in abdominal sonography? Um, is, it a, is it a liver tumor that we find first that we biopsy? That will then, um, or is it through endoscopy, through a regular checkup? Um, that will really decide on how we then continue with our diagnostic approach. Then we will, it will lead to a clinical staging. There again, important is the dotated PET, the gallium dotated PET, PET and the FDG PET. And um, we can also add on depending on where it's located. And um, we can also, for example, go for colonoscopy or endoscopy to, to further either get a biopsy or to help us locate the tumor exactly. The use of biochemical markers, again, can also help us, um, but have a higher um, value in the follow-up of these tumors. We can then differentiate again between functioning and non-functioning. This is then important for the perioperative management, especially if carcinoid syndrome is present, but that will go over the scope of this um, lecture. But just to keep in mind that as soon as carcinoid syndrome is in the play, we will have other approaches and other perioperative guidelines that we will need to follow. The most important, again, is if a biopsy can be attained, it should be attained, and um, we will do, again, the immune histochemical staining with chromogranin A and simnaptophycin, and again, of course, the grading through the KI67 and mitotic index. This is vital part for the therapeutic algorithm. This will then lead, again, to a staging um, of the neuroendocrine tumor of the small intestine, um, here, the cutoff is one centimeter, and also in, in what region that it infiltrates um, histologically. And as soon, of course, as we have a nodal involvement, that will really up, upstage the tumor for quite a bit into a stage three. So if you put this all together, this is the guidelines that the ENETS gives us, and um, comprised in about 20 different pages, but this is like the overview of what we would do as diagnostic procedure, as a puzzle, and put that together individually for every patient. So the therapeutic approach in localized disease, meaning if we have a stage T1 to T3 without nodal involvement, will be a radical resection with the resection of the lymph nodes along the mesenteric root. The aim here is that the patient is tumor free and um, that we really get all of the tumor out. We will do the same if there is a nodal involvement present um, in the case of regional disease. Here we have different problems that arise through the resection of the lymph nodes in the mesenteric area. Um, number one, um, at least eight lymph nodes are needed for a proper histological workup and to really define the stage of this patient. And if more than four lymph nodes are positive in this histological analysis, this coincides with the earlier um, recurrence of the disease. The problem is that we work along the mesenteric root um, and along the mesenteric vasculature. So the higher up we go, the bigger the area that is um, per perfused by um, the, the vasculature will fall during this operation, so it could lead theoretically to very large resection margins. Another problem that presents that uh, up to 33% of lymph node metastases are not resectable due to their location. Then, as a, as a last part, if we then talk about distant disease, we'll have um, Again, other approaches, usually we still go for a radical, we'll, we'll take out the primary tumor in order to, to, take, uh, to avoid complications that may arise, including obstruction and bleeding. And then, of course, if it is a metastasized disease, there will be talk of chemo radiotherapy and so on. Just to finish, um, the follow-up of the jejunum and the ileum um, is also according to their grade and to their stage. So if it's curatively resected, we will have, of course, less follow-up, whereas if there is residual tumor or metastasis, we have a much closer uh, follow-up, also depending if carcinoid syndrome is present or not. So the take-home messages from today, neuroendocrine neoplasms remain a rare entity, but they're on the rise for us. 
Important, every specific entity has a specific treatment, so not every patient is the same. Every patient should go to an interdisciplinary net board, which we have here at our hospital, and there are new discoveries in this area every day. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, Federico, thank you very much. Excellent presentation. Very didactic, nice slide. So thank you. I think all of us, we, we learn. We don't see many of these uh, tumors yet when they are here. It's very important to recognize them early as you just write here to submit to an interdisciplinary net board because they behave differently than other tumors. And we have usually to do different treatment, at least they have a long-term plan since the long-term survival of this patient is much better than any other uh, tumors. Maybe two questions, mostly to uh, Professor Lehmann here. One, maybe shortly, just to discuss liver transplant. I mean, we discussed that. We don't transplant where he is. Yeah, he, we don't transplant many of them. Maybe just shortly for the, for the audience. Next, what sometimes we face, we have the metastasis. We operate that, but we don't find the primary tumors. So we have new diagnostic tests today that uh, make that more uh, accurate. But my second question is how aggressive should we be to identify the uh, primary tumors? Uh, in these patients. Okay, that's two complex questions. Thank you very much. Thanks, Federico, for your nice talk. Um, first, to look for the primaries. Actually, uh, a non-identification of a primary tumor in a well-differentiated net is rather rare. What happens often, particularly in small bowel nets, is that metastasis or lymph nodes are much larger than uh, the primary tumor, which is often centimetric uh, located in, in the small bowel uh, just before the ileocecal uh, valve. But very often those well-differentiated tumors are detectable by a gallium PET. So that's our new, or it's not new, but that's kind of a standard to, to look for primaries. Um, it's more often in, uh, in uh, well, let's say a subtype of uh, neuroendocrine tumors, which is uh, Small bowel carcinoma, there it can happen that the primary vanishes, but that's a different disease and uh, has a different tumor biology. With regard to um, aggressive treatment of metastasis, we did not talk about that. There are multiple uh, strategies, uh, receptor therapy, peptide-related receptor therapy, for example, has made some tremendous advances over the last years. Um, somatostatin hormone treatment has evolved and of course surgical strategies and surgical strategies become more prominent the lower the biology and for liver transplant the, the tumor has to be limited to the liver and it should have a, a good biology so it's usually G1 or low G2 um, and not uh, too much of the liver um, about 50, less than 50% should be involved. And then these candidates can be um, e uh, evaluated for liver transplant. But we do not have so much comparative data, so we do not know um, if it's um, better to resect them or better to transplant them. It's mostly a large series from uh, Milano that uh, suggests that liver transplant may be uh, an excellent treatment for those patients, but that's something that evolves uh, day by day. What about conservative uh, treatment or palliative uh, medical treatment or immunotherapy? Is there anything uh, new? Yes. Well, Federico mostly talked about localized disease and the cornerstone treatment uh, of localized disease is still surgery. I think there is no good role for uh, medical treatment in those patients. Um, local resection, for example, endoscopic resection is usually not recommended for small bowel tumors because they have an extremely high rate of lymph node metastasis. So that, that's also not advocated. It's a good option in rectal nets. Uh, if they're limited to the mucosa, they should be only resected by endoscopy. And so the new kits uh, on the block for medical treatment are particularly the agonist uh, peptide-related uh, receptor therapies that may be slightly more specific and more 
tear into those receptors and, and work better than the current an antagonists. Thank you very much. Great presentation. I have a question regarding guidelines. I feel that whenever we speak about neuroendocrine tumors, we very heavily rely on ENET's guidelines. And I think the same goes for our clinical practice every day. So my question really is how scientifically valid are those guidelines? How often are they updated? Do we really need to follow them that closely? Or is there other evidence that we need to take into account um, in the individual decision-making process? Yeah, I love that question um, because it's very important to realize that most of those guidelines should be actually considered as recommendations. For example, the recommendation for the appendix is based on, let's say, 200 patients, retrospective series, um, multivariate analysis of risk factors for uh, progression to lymph node metastasis. And there is, maybe not day by day, but every other year, uh, there, there are larger series that remodel those uh, recommendations. And I think it's very important to keep an eye on the literature uh, what happens in large centers and 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 they these recommendations are updated uh, time by time. Yes. Okay.